We are pleased to introduce Reverend Dr. Marcus Allen to the Kingdom Justice Summit. Dr. Allen serves as the senior pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church and is the current president of the African American Council of Churches in Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Allen served honorably in the United States Army for over 10 years. Dr. Allen received the Bronze Star Medal, which is one of the highest military honors, as well as numerous other awards. Dr. Allen received his Doctorate of Ministry degree from Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the author of a new book, I Got Next, 10 Essential Lessons for Effective Pastoral Transition. He is married to the former Tara Cook, and God has blessed them with three beautiful children, Alexandria, Micaiah, and Marcus Jr. Please join us in welcoming Reverend Dr. Marcus Allen. I want to thank um, John Anderson and for inviting me to speak at this much-needed conference. I commend John for trying to do something that Christ died for on the cross for us all. That is to unify God's children. However, the divide seems greater today than it was between Jewish and Gentile Christians after the start of the first church. I'm one that believes that until the universal church truly operates in unity that the world will continue to be in chaos. Come in, John, and the vision for a collaboration project and this Kingdom Justice Summit. And I pray that um, you all will receive this message on today that will give you inspiration and hope to commit to, to justice. John gave me the theme, um, and it is from Lament to to hope to be clear a lament is not a complaint to lament means to express deep sorrow to mourn or to cry with great grief a lament is a sorrowful prayer while a complaint expresses displeasure in someone or concern due to something not going in your favor a complaint is the children of Israel being liberated from slavery and years of oppression, but because they are not enjoying the food of the wilderness, they make the complaint. Things were, was much better back in Egypt. We, we, we see a prayer of lament even from the Savior, Jesus Christ himself, God wrapped in flesh. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in the Message Bible, it reads in Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38, says this, Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he, Jesus, plunged into an agonizing sorrow. Then he said, this sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here and keep visual with me. I say this to inform you all who are watching today that if Jesus can lament, so can we. A lament never removes God's ability to help us in sorrowful situations. A lament does not suggest that you have lost your faith in God. And if any time that we could lament, I believe that each of us have something to lament about today. We are almost a year into a worldwide pandemic that has caused, that has completely interrupted every aspect of our lives. We have learned how to wear masks, carry hand sanitizer, and practice social distance. We have watched the news as the number of deaths continue uh, to climb day after day, and now those numbers have turned into names for me. I lament myself at how I can see my members one day and a few weeks later receiving calls that they've died from COVID-19. I lament for families who have had to allow their family members or loved ones to die alone. April 2020, my, my mom, she had COVID-19 and it was one of the most challenging times of my life. I couldn't visit her, couldn't hold her hand, 
couldn't go to where she was. I had to just wait and pray at my home. But my mom, she told me the way she was able to make it through this deadly virus, this deadly disease, she said she prayed unto God. God, breathe into me like you breathe into Adam when you made him. And that has been my prayer for members. I get phone calls from that tell me that they have this deadly virus and I can hear in their voice as they're gasping for air, trying to breathe on their own. And my prayer for them is, Lord, please breathe into them like you breathe into Adam. But what has caused me also to lament the more is that we have observed how there has been no federal mandates to states to how they should handle the virus. And when the governor of Wisconsin attempted to implement the Badger bounce back plan, it was challenged, struck down with nothing to replace it. For months, counties and cities in this state have had to decide what's best for its own citizens. No matter of race, social status, denominational affiliation, we all are experiencing the rate uh, the stress and the strain of this pandemic. We all have a right to lament. We have a right to lament and just even a few, a few months into this deadly pandemic, sometime in May, we all watched a black man die on camera again. George Floyd is his name. Police had been called because he was suspected of using counterfeit money on multiple cameras. A police officer pressed his knee into the neck of this man for over eight minutes to the point where a grown man called for his mother who was not even alive. But then he proclaimed, I can't breathe. This is a familiar story for African-American community a phrase that has been used from the beginning of when we were snatched from the shores of Africa and forced to be slaves in America, I can't breathe. When we endured the brutal back-breaking work of slavery, the beatings with whips and the destruction of our families, I can hear my ancestors shout, I can't breathe. When we have had to endure Jim Crow, separate but equal lies, segregation, and the lynching tree, these same words echo in my mind from my ancestors. I can't breathe. And even now today in this pandemic, when we have a vaccine, the many in the African-American community are fearful of even taking it because of the history of this nation and our health care towards black Americans. In 1932, 1932, the Tuskegee Institute began a study to record the natural history of the disease called syphilis. It was called Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. Many men suffered physically. They infected their loved ones. They experienced neurological problems and some even died from this disease. And because of this unfair and unjust of study of human beings with medicine. And for all of this, black people should not be the only ones lamenting over human rights issues. This should especially be a lament of or an outcry and, and, and the church of God shouting and screaming out for justice for all. We all have the right to lament. This year, we watch one of the most unique presidential elections that has ever taken place. In all my years of voting, the first Tuesday in November has always been the time in, in which the presidential race, what may have been called or, or the, the loser will concede. However, this has not been the case in 2020. We watch multiple recounts throughout the states. I never paid this much attention to the certification of the state's ballots or the electrics, uh, the electoral ballots by the Congress being voted in. These procedures were never of any concern to many of us. However, due to the election being challenged on every end, we watched and wondered what would happen January 6th. We watched as rioters and terrorists charged the Capitol, murdering pol a police officer, destroying property, feet propped up on the, speakers, uh, the Speaker of the House desk because of the thought that someone was trying to steal the election and steal their country. 
Can I tell you how most black people felt about watching this insurrection? On the Monday of this same week, a police officer in Kenosha was cleared of any wrongdoing of shooting a black man in the back who was walking away eight times. But thousands stormed the Capitol and we only heard of one shot being fired. I'm not calling for violence, but I'm just looking for equality. August 2020, black people formed the March on Washington, and during the time they were there, National Guards were defending statues. But when the officials of the State House heard that thousands of white people were planning to come, they rejected the help and was unprepared for the storming of the State House. But what really caused me the pain and heartache was to see signs that declared Jesus saves and the Christian flag marching through the state house alongside of the Confederate flag declaring hate and racist activities. For all of this death and dying, this trauma and this pain, this hatred and this division, this injustice and racism, we all have legitimate reasons to express deep sorrow, to mourn, and to cry out with great grief. In the search of biblical text to explain the theme of the summit from lament to hope, God directed me to Psalm 137 verses one through six. And it reads this way, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we weeped, and when we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willow in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered, plundered us requested myrrh, saying, Sing one of those songs of Zion. Verse 4 reads, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. I want to talk to you from the topic today. I still have a song. Now, I told you about all the bad stuff we went through and all the bad stuff we endured. But I want to let you know today, I still have a song to sing. When I was a little boy in Sunday school class, my Sunday school teachers told me that every Christian should have a favorite scripture and a favorite song. Whenever you're going through deep, depressing times, when you have this scripture and this song, it is as if it's giving you hope to march on just a little while longer. August, I, August 2001, I joined the United States Army, and I was not a good runner at all. And in order to pass basic training when your first initial training you have to do the run in a particular uh, amount of time I failed the run at every test but it wasn't until the last test and uh, that I was about to take and during this test while I was running I was singing songs in my head and one song I was singing was on my way home or on my way home because I knew if I failed this test I was not on my way home I was on my way back to more training and I would have to stay there. But this song, it gave me hope that if I just kept on running, I can make it home. Here in the text, my brothers and sisters, we find that around 586 BC, the children of Israel became slaves to the people of Babylon. So here, an unknown summness writes of their anger, their pain, and their frustration, he laments. He tells of how they threw their harps in the tree and they refused to sing a song. The children of Israel, they were in an unfamiliar place like many of us today. We're wondering, where are we? Is this a strange land that we are in? They were 500 miles away from their homeland, and the Bible says they sat down, which means they were weary. They, they, they had begun to weep, which suggests that they were expressing great grief, lamenting when they remembered Zion. 
when they look back and saw how things used to be in their past, it caused them pain in their presence, but it also prompted them to lose hope in their future. They were hopeless. So they threw their harps in the trees, in the willows. The harp was used to bring joy and to calm the spirit, calm the soul. But here are some oppressed people who suggest that the harp is not working for them. They threw them in the tree as to lament their pain in their hurt. Verse one and two, they are in a strange place, sitting from hard labor, weeping from suffering, hung their harps from losing hope. And now their adversary demands them to sing a song. After the enemy witnessed them throwing their harps in the trees, they add pressure to their pain. Sing us one of those songs. And it's obvious that something, uh, this was something that these people enjoyed to do. They may have enjoyed singing. Their passion may have been singing and playing the harp. They may have been the praise team who had now thrown their harps in the tree. But now the enemy is demanding a song. Their songs would explain whose and who their God was. Their song would have talked about the power of God, and they requested this in a way to tell the children of Israel, where is your God now? The Babylonians knew the history of Israel, of how they won battles and how God had delivered them from all of their enemies. But now the Babylonians had conquered something that had seemed unconquerable or impossible, which was the children of Israel. Sing us a song. The children of Israel asked the question that many of us may be posing today. How can we sing the Lord's song? in a strange land. I want to help someone today and inform you that this is a good place to sing our songs of hope because you singing brings you hope and it brings a melody to your pain. A strange place is the perfect place for a song of hope. The enemy may assume that your sing, you're singing discredits who your God is, but it displays your faith and your confidence in your God. Hope has the melody and the rhythm that helps us to cope with the thoughts of hopelessness. Music speaks a universal language. Concerts and musicals are great tools of bringing people together. We all may not sing in the same key, but we can make a joyful noise that pulls us all in singing on the same level or singing the same words. We all can sing, we shall overcome, because if we are not unified in our efforts to free others from oppression and division, we would never be the church that God has called us to be. We are currently observing in the Christian church uh, that this, this, this uh, coming together is not coming, we're not coming closer, but we're widening out. It's a hopeful sight each year when I walk into my church and observe the King Coalition choir singing songs of hope and unity. The choir stand is full in a predominantly black church. It's full of people from different races, black and white people, poor and affluent people, but they are there unified together singing songs of hope. Kingdom justice demands hope because many have been devoid of justice and hope in our community. And we as Christians, we have not been good neighbors to our people. We see the wounded, and if they're not associated to us in some form, we fail to offer help. The Good Samaritan is the perfect picture of hope. 
He stops. He helps a foreigner that hates him because of his nationality. He puts him on his own beast, surrendering his, uh, his own piece of walking. He takes him to the end, but the hope is he reminds the innkeeper, I'm going to give you this and this man to take care of, but when I return, I'll pay you whatever I owe. The hope is that the good Samaritan says, I will return to provide more help if needed. Christians have been commissioned by God to be hope dealers. Hey, hope dealers. The the gospel is the message of hope, and we must tell the story of Jesus Christ more than anything. Christians, we find hope in the gospel. Jesus lived, he died, but early one morning he was resurrected from the dead and he's coming again to receive us unto himself. We are the hope that the world needs to see. We often pray for God to change the world, but when he selects us to be the change, we declare we're not qualified. The hope for the world is in the hands of the church. The kingdom justice we need to see in our communities must be demanded by the church. The injustice of black children not learning at the same rate as others must be demanded by the church and not just the black community. The injustice of our health system that fails to take care of the marginalized must be demanded by the church and not just the marginalized. The injustice of housing crisis in which we are facing even here in Dane County must be a corporate voice of the church and not just of those who are struggling with housing. The church should be a choir singing the words of hope to the community and to the world. We can lament all day, but there must be a song of hope that calls us to action to the least, the lost, and the left behind. Psalms 137, verses 5 through 6, the attitude of the sumness changes. Verses 1 through 3, there is no hope. They lament, let's just hang our hearts in the tree because of what we're going through. But verse 5 says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. I'm glad today, my brothers and sisters, as I read this story, that the psalmist does not throw their harps, does not throw their harps in the rivers of Babylon. They do not destroy their harps. They just put them in the tree which means they can go back and retrieve them when they get the hope they need in order to complete their life's journey. I'm glad that they didn't crush their hearts, but they just hung them in the tree, and they were able to return when they remembered. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we have to press stop, rewind, and play on our lives. Because the hope of tomorrow is developed from how God, how we experienced God yesterday. The hope of tomorrow is how we experience God yesterday. When it looks like there is no way out, no reason to sing, or it feels like you're fighting a losing battle, you better learn how to look back over your life and retrieve some of the memories of God doing wonderful and great things, and that will give you hope to face tomorrow. You must remember how God got you out the last time when you were in a bad predicament. The children of Israel faced this situation before. Last time they were in Egypt. This time they're in Babylon. It's the same problem, different people, but we must remember it's the same God. And if God did it before, he's able to do it again. In the book, Freeing Charles, the struggle to free slaves on the eve of the Civil War by Scott Christensen, he talks about the worship that took place in Bush meetings. Unlike the stiff, restrained hymn singing heard in the white slave master churches, the singing in the woods, it moved people to tears and joy, wild clapping, stomping, shaking, and dancing, and due to them not having Having a temple, they put themselves in thick, they put together 
thick branches with leaves to construct camouflage canopies with backs and sides. Women would bring pots and pans or blankets to worship in order to muffle the sound of their shouts and singing. And sometimes they would stick their heads in the pot to be loud without their slave master hearing them sing. One member named Sister Jeffries would pray and shout all night while others would be anxious to take their turn. And sometimes they would have to pull Sister Jeffries from out of the pot. These were slave people experiencing oppression and brutal uh, attacks on their lives in their bodies, but they still had a reason to sing. They still had a song to sing with no hope of tomorrow, feeling helpless in their conditions. They still found the way to sing even in the midst of hopeless situation. And if slaves can sing of hope, truly we can sing today of our own hope. And I just can imagine that some of these people, these slaves, will sing the hymn, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is singing Sam. This hope we are looking to receive must also be be a hope we're willing to give. The kingdom choir must sing the song of hope to a dying world who is in distress. And until we become that choir, that community choir of hope, our world will remain in chaos. But when the church sings songs of hope in stressful and distressful times, people will see God and glorify him no matter what's going on. God bless you.